Welshpool Station, Welshpool, historic town, once the centre of the old Welsh Principality of Powys. And from the station platform you can see in the far distance the towers of Powys Castle coming peeping up among the trees. But of course railway enthusiasts don't worry about that. They know it as the starting point of one of the most delightful of the little lines of Wales. The Welshpool and the Llanfair Cairainon Light Railway. As a matter of fact, it started from just across the tracks over there, and I'm delighted to tell you, though it doesn't start from here anymore, the Sandvire and Welshpool Railway still exist, and it flourishes. <laughs> Panting up the mountains, chugging through the vales, go the gallant little railway. Lines of Wales, the firebox glows, the pistons gleam, the engines puffing, celestial steam. And the Welsh pool sandbar trains on hand to take you through the kindly borderland. And the land of my father's looks twice as fine. You see it from a carriage and a railway line. Where is this delectable railway? The map shows the green edge of the Welsh border, and that wriggling caterpillar is the line, starting now near the edge of Welsh Pool and going deep into the lost hills of mid Wales. I said it once started at Welsh Pool Station itself, and the old track is still there in part, grass grown, running around the backs of the houses, right in the middle of the town. But when the line first closed in 1956, nobody thought it would ever return. The local brass band played Handel's Funeral March as the final train puffed along these lines. And the authorities gave up. A main road and a roundabout cut across Raven Square. The motor car seemed to have conquered forever. And you can drive there now and never realise that you are changing gear over the first section of the proud Welsh Pool and Llanfair Railway. The train once puffed along this street and the railway hut at the bottom there is now the headquarters of the Salvation Army. Well, they may have had a service for fallen railways. But just on the further side of Raven Square, here where the buffers stand, the line starts again. And on it, the new owners of the Welsh Pool and Llanfair are determined that the train shall run again. Oh, the undergrowth is thick, but the railway enthusiasts plunge into it to find the rusted points. And they use a little light diesel engine to push along the disused track to start the work that will eventually bring the line the whole way back to Welshpool. Oh, I admit my heart goes out to these enthusiasts. They're not professionals. The line has been restored by the voluntary work of the steam railway fans. They're simply people who are enchanted by the sight and sound of steam. And they run the railway as a labour of love. Very successfully too, coming down on weekends, clearing the undergrowth, relaying the track and sleeping in old railway coaches at Llanfair. The company solicitor has his weekend dossed down in this old plate layer's hut. They've got the whole line now running again from Llanfair to Sylvain Holt. At Sylvain, the engines are turned around by a complicated piece of shunting that gladdens the heart of the amateur railwayman. The engines, or two of them at any rate, the Earl and the Countess, date from the very beginning of the line and are still going strong, and they're the main target for visitors' photographs. They must have been really brilliantly designed, for before they got to Sylvine, they had to climb the Golver Bank, one of the steepest gradients on any railway line in Britain, one in 30, no less. The engines were built in 1902, and in those days they cost £1,500 each. 
and when the new company was formed, it got one of the engines from British Rail for just over £600. What do they like to drive? Well, according to Frank Cooper, engine driver and insurance broker from Birmingham... They're not like a car. There's no key that you turn and it switches on. Um, this morning, for example, it's taken about two hours to raise steam. Another day, it might take two and a half hours. Another day, it only takes an hour and a half. And once it's down the line, the coal might burn well, it might not burn well, it might clink, your fire might half go out. Uh, so you've got this constant battle of wits. Uh, this particular engine today, Earl's good. Countess, his counterpart, was a little bit more temperate. I think it's probably because it was named after a lady. <laughs> What sort of countryside does the line run through? Well, I think it is still happily one of the least known, unspoilt, green, rural paradises I know of in Wales. It doesn't really go anywhere in a hurry. It doesn't want to, just like its train. A pattern of green fields at the bottom of the valley, and away in the background, the lovely hill pastures, speckled with sheep. Maybe that's the reason why the line never paid, except for a brief moment in World War I. The main customers were the farmers' wives going down to Welshpool Market, and the farmers loading sheep and fat cattle. The line was once the proud possessor of eight sheep wagons, capable of carrying 25 sheep each. Not a very large capacity, and the original shareholders must have wondered as the flocks were loaded into the trains and then the engine went puffing through the green fields, whether they were not going down bleating into bankruptcy. They were rather glad to be taken over by the Cambrian, and the Cambrian was equally delighted to be swallowed by the GWR. And the shareholders got 24 and a half p for their pound shares, just like today. The gauge is two feet six inches, and this does allow the train almost to wriggle along between the hedges. Oh, this is a real country line. There are moments when you feel you can slip out and pick daisies and hop back on again. As the Earl waves its banner of steam amongst the trees, I think back to the first train, travelling this way in 1903, over 70 years ago and all the high hopes it carried. The Prince of Wales feathers fixed onto both ends of the locomotive, and the motto on the boiler, success to the W and L railway. And the band in full dress uniform playing Men of Harlech. And the journey along this section made, as the local paper reported, in record time, at least 10 miles an hour. At Coppice Lane, the line crosses a little country road. Between you and me, it's not the busiest thoroughfare in Wales. I've never seen more than a car or two on it, or oh, and three stray sheep. But the Light Railways Act demands that a man with a red flag shall stand to warn the dense approaching traffic, and the Welshpool and Llanfair scrupulously observes the law. The next stop is the delightful and ancient village of Castell Carañón. This is the central point of the line at present, just over four miles from Llanvile. It is the proud possessor of a passing loop, a cattle dock, but no cattle to take on board, and a signal box. Now, so far, the line has passed over land which belonged, or once belonged, to the great Powys Castle estate. The Earl of Powys was a strong supporter of the original line, and the first engines were named the Countess and the Earl. And the splendours of Powys Castle itself are only a few miles away across the hills. One of the great castles of Wales. The old apartments were splendidly reconstructed in the late 17th century. And the gardens are elegantly formal in the classical style of the period. Terrace rising above flower-filled terrace. Chaste statues. 
Long alleys and close-cut privet hedges stretching away to flower beds, haunted by the most industrious bees in the business. And not so far away, over the brow of the hill, the little engines are puffing along as busy as the bees. Back to the train, waiting still at Castel Carignan station. And to a surprise. Not far from the station, Mrs. Elizabeth Ann Hughes of Penabrin Farm is drawing a strange and fascinating discovery. This now rather tangled up looking farm building, with great timber posts but with a rough corrugated iron roofing, is far more ancient than it looks. Mrs. Hughes was trained as an artist and she spotted these remarkable oak beams. They are characteristic of what are called aisled halls in the manor houses of the 13th and 14th century. This is the only one of its kind in Montgomeryshire. And the only other parts of the country where you find them are Suffolk and Norfolk and the Cheshire-Denbyshire border. The beams are carved and pegged together. And there are plenty of carpenter's marks on them. In those days, many craftsmen didn't write so that they made circles and other marks to show how the beam should be fitted together. Of course, the story goes that Henry VII stayed the night here when he was marching through Wales on his way to Bosworth Field. Was there any place in mid Wales where he didn't? Still, here it stands, a bit battered, but still a real medieval hall. Can we hope it will be cared for and restored to its old splendour? Can we see the fire burning again in the wide medieval fireplace? Just as it's been made to burn bright again in the firebox of the gallant old locomotive, the Earl, as it puffs out of Castel Carignan. Joining me now on board, the Dowager Countess of Paris. I know she doesn't mind me saying that she's over 80, and her daughter, Lady Clive. Here we go, Lady Paris. Not it's your first trip, though. No, not in uh, by a long way. My husband and I very often came. He was particularly fond of the railway, and I've had many journeys on this beautiful railway. It goes over a great part of your estate, though, doesn't it? I think it does. I think that a great many years ago, Lord Place at that time gave that part of the estate to the railway. Lady Clive, it was your father-in-law, wasn't it, who actually cut the first sod in 1901. Uh, well, he didn't. It was his eldest son who cut the first yes. sod, but he um, opened it. Uh, and I think they had a great opening <laughs> with champagne in jugs all round. And then his son cut the first sod with a silver spade. Oh, those were the so, days. <laughs> yeah. Yes, those were the days. But the present days of the Welsh Pool and Llanfire are surely very much better. It's not struggling along desperately to avoid bankruptcy as it did for many years when it first opened this deep countryside producing only agricultural traffic, timber and cattle and sheep was probably the despair of the first promoters. But it's now the basis for the increasing success of the present railway. This is what the city bred visitors come to enjoy. Not a car in sight, only the fields of corn on the green hills, the tall trees and the thick hedges. On this line you not only take a ticket to scenery but to serenity.
Now as the train puffs along, you can see that three of the coaches look very unlike anything you've seen on British lines. As a matter of fact, they are Austrian. They have the characteristic continental platforms before and behind. And they come from the Zillertalbahn. There are very friendly relations between the two preservation societies, and the coaches have come in very handy. Plenty of spy films with a hero being chased desperately by the Nazis or clinging precariously to the roof are just as likely to have been filmed not in the wilds of Bavaria and Switzerland, but here in the Gittings Farm field, alongside the happy little Sandvire Railway. As a matter of fact, the farmer at Gittings Farm wasn't altogether pleased when the line restarted. Would it disturb the cattle? But now he's one of its strongest supporters, and a well-established custom demands that every fireman or driver gives him a ceremonious wave of the cap as the train passes. The job of fireman isn't just as simple as waving a cap. For example, as a fireman, you can put almost anybody on the engine and you'll get there. You may not get there on time, you may not get there very well, but you will get there. But the real art of firing is to do it well, and that's very, very difficult indeed. To get there without blowing off steam, without lose, using too much coal, without losing time, without worrying your driver in any way. And that's, what, that's the challenge of it all, and I think that's what keeps a lot of us coming to the railway. The run is halt and the red flag out as the line goes over a country road. Sandbire is just over two miles away, but they're pretty eventful two miles. And in the early days of the railway, it would have cost you just over tuppence to cover them. The Act established that the railway company should carry passengers at the rate of a penny per mile. Tell that to British Rail. But there are other serious hazards on the way. Gazing anxiously ahead, the driver and fireman await the deadly danger cry. The brakes are applied. The gallant train halts in the nick of time. Look ahead. Sheep on the line. On the way again. Now, after Kavrunev, the line has been coming down towards the valley of the river Banwe. The Banwe rises away in a lonely part of the mid Wales mountains and flows down to join the Vurnwe, and together they flow into the Severn. Here, the drop down to the Banwe itself is quite steep, and they had to build a small but very solid viaduct over a side stream. But after this first viaduct, the train must start to slow down quite a bit. There's a place ahead where care must be taken. Banui Bridge. And you look down from the bridge onto the clear, rippling waters of the Banui itself. And they look enchanting. So does the whole rich countryside, for that matter. No possible problems here, you'd think. But the Banui is a not-so-gay deceiver. In summer, it's a great trout and salmon stream. You could stand here drowsily casting a fly and let your eye travel down with the lulling sound of the water to the bridge. And then you get a reminder of the Banui's treachery. Two of the old piers have been replaced by steel construction. The original piers were stone. But in December 1964, the Banu rose at an astonishing speed. It often rises two feet in an hour, but this time it surpassed itself in fury. When the piers went over, the Preservation Society might have gone over too. But with some help from the Royal Engineers, the Society restored the bridge, so now the trains ride on again in triumph towards Slanvile. The line goes past the old Henyaf mill. It's now a holiday home. But it dates back to 1827. Oh, they knew how to build solidly in those days. And the mill race still goes tumbling through the sluices alongside. In 
into the home run now to Sanva Carreño. The line has one more problem to face. It is now right alongside the edge of the river Banui, and on it is another mill, Tolrid Mill. There wasn't much space, and the original planners declared that the line would have to be squeezed past the mill, and that's just what it does. You can almost touch the old water wheel as the line goes into the squeeze. Around the last corner and through the tall grass and the trees and the flowers that seem never to have left the track all the way. And alongside the main road and San Val Carañón ahead. Nine and a half miles from Silva. home signal box and the volunteers who man it have to be as careful and as disciplined as any professional signal. The staff must be exchanged. This is one of the oldest railway safety precautions. No engine driver can take his train onwards unless he possesses the magic staff that makes him free of the next section of the line. Safely to journey's end. Sanvar Carañón Station. The headquarters of this little company of dedicated men, oh, and their patient wives, were brought back to life the old Welshpool and Sanvar Railway, and sent the cheerful sound of steam echoing again in the quiet valley of the Banway. And why do they do it? Let Mr. Ken Fenton, fireman and a managing director from Birmingham, make his confession. Well, I think it begins at a very early age when you're a small boy, if you're interested in railway engines. When you go to the station, you see these tremendous locomotives with all this steam and power and vigour, and you think, my, wouldn't it be marvellous if I could drive one of those? And then when you get older, if it persists, well then, nowadays you can join a company like this, and you have an opportunity to really achieve your ambition. And who wouldn't delight to achieve his ambition of driving a railway train that comes to a delightful full stop in Sanvar Carañón? Sanvar of the rich valley, of the bright salmon stream of the Banui, Sanvar of the green hills. Could any railway passenger find a better place to answer the call, all change? Yes, all change for unspoilt whales. Panting up the mountains, chugging through the vales, go the gallant little railway. Lines of whales, the firebox glows, the pistons gleam, the engines puffing, celestial steam. And the Welsh pool sandbar trains on hand to take you through the kindly borderland. And the land of my father's looks twice as fine. You see it from a carriage and a railway. 